Well, I suppose in terms of an introduction to Marx's political economy, what I sort of really want to do is to present Marx really as a revolutionary, an activist, and not somebody who is quite commonly thought of as just sitting in the British Library and writing Capital and this man that just churned out a whole number of books and theories and if you go to university and you study Marx, you can study Marx the sociologist, Marx the economist and so on. There's a constant attempt, I think, within academia to remove Marx from what he was, which was an active revolutionary who analysed and tried to decipher capitalism on the basis of how he could change it. And I think that's an important thing because Marx really was a revolutionary with a purpose. And Marx also, alongside Engels, was an active revolutionary. He wrote revolutionary papers. He was part of forming the first uh, Workers' International. He was exiled from many European states for being a threat to the bourgeoisie. So this is a man who is actively attempting to understand capitalism in order to be able to change it. He's not a dry academic. And so what I want to sort of try and look at really is how Marx actually became a Marxist. And Marx was born in 1818 in Trier in Germany. So he was born almost 30 years after the French Revolution of 1789 and 30 years before the revolutions of 1848 swept across Europe. And the reason why I think those things are important is because it's about putting a context really to a society that was going through a massive transformation, a massive period of change, and here we have, in the middle of this, a whole set of different uh, philosophers, thinkers, who are trying to make sense of how these different changes and huge changes have taken place across the world. And Marx really bore witness, along with many others, to the transformation of society from feudalism to capitalism. And of course, his, therefore, his attempts to understand this were shaped by a whole number of thinkers around him and by a whole number of set of um, experiences. And there are three things really that I want to concentrate on in terms of trying to understand how Marx became a Marxist. There's a fantastic little essay by Lenin called The Three Component Parts of Marxism, in which what he puts forward is, is that German philosophy, French socialism and British political economy were the three things that really contributed towards Marx becoming a Marxist. And I want to start really with German philosophy. I don't know whether people have heard of a philosopher called Hegel, but Hegel was an incredibly influential thinker, probably one of the most important thinkers of his time. Um, so Hegel really had attempted to try and understand the process of change within society and to understand how a new society had emerged out of an old society. So we have this old system of feudalism where the dominant, um, the dominant sort of forces in society were the church and the nobility, the bourgeois, you know, no, the nobility as in the landed gentry and so on. These were the big institutions in society uh, that ran everything, that controlled everything. The whole process of um, uh, thought and so on, the whole process of how to uh, understand ideas and so on was very much dominated by uh, religion um, and by the idea and notion of presence of God. And also, um, you know, if you look at the relationship between the landed gentry and the peasantry and so on, a credibly oppressive class society um, that existed as well. But this society gave birth to capitalism. Um, as well. And so, you know, people may know from probably you sub study some of this stuff at school about some of the ideas that were emerging in society at the time. You know, some very heretical ideas, for example. There was a whole new um, forms of science that were, that, were, that were being written about, new ideas that were being established. You know, heretical ideas, for example, like the, um, the sun didn't move around the earth, the earth moved around the sun. You know, I mean, these, I mean, it might sound mad now, but it gives you a picture of what type of society it was when actually science was seen as being a major threat to the, to the old order um, and to the existing, the existing society. And so, 
there were really new ideas breaking through, scientific ideas that said that you could understand things through science. Things weren't mystical anymore. There was a way of understanding the world and what was going on, what was going on around it. You know, there's a, people would also probably heard of the Enlightenment. You know, it's a whole set of, the, it really encompasses really these new ideas that were emerging at the time in terms of science, in terms of philosophy and so on. And <coughs> clearly the way that the Enlightenment is, is interpreted in lots of ways is that this was the ideological manifestation of a society that was starting to go through a tremendous change. And of course we have new elements of exploration taking place, um, trade, production, new, new elements of production were being established by a new emerging class of merchants who developed into a revolutionary new class, the bourgeoisie. And we have to remember the bourgeoisie were the revolutionary class of the time. When we think now of the ruling class and the bourgeoisie under capitalism, they are clearly repressing massively any sense or idea of change. These are not people who are forward thinking. They're people who want to hold this society down to keep themselves on the top and to benefit themselves. When actually there was the transformation from feudalism to capitalism, this new bourgeoisie, this new emerging class, were a set of people who were revolutionary, who wanted to batten down the notions of superstition and God and the church as being the big institutions, who wanted to shatter the nobility, being able to hold on to and limit trade. So these people really were both informed by the ideas of the Enlightenment, but also because of part, partly because of those ideas as well, were starting to really challenge and change society. And so really what Hegel did was attempt to, uh, or did actually put, really a framework for understanding how out of this old backward society, this new society could emerge and this new class could break out of it. And one of the sort of important parts of his, of his ideas and, and the method which Hegel used to do this is something which we call the dialectic. Now there's a whole meeting on the dialectic at Marxism as well. I'm not going to be able to cover every aspect of it, but I want to try and give a flavour of what the dialectic um, was about. And there are two really essential points to the dialectic. And that is, is that all things in and of themselves are contradictory. And that contradiction is the root of all movement within life. Further to that, only insofar as anything contains a contradiction, does it move, does it have impulse, and does it have activity. And I want to try and explain this, because when you think about how can a new society emerge out of an old one, you're talking about something new coming, in, coming forward and getting rid of something it had gone, had gone before. But the old also gave birth to the new. So how do we explain the contradiction that exists there? And I suppose in some ways it's almost easier to put an abstract example onto something to try and explain it in, in a general sense. And one of the things which um, both um, Engels uses and so on is an example of the acorn and the oak because we all know that we can't have oak trees without acorns. But the acorn has to disappear in order for the oak tree to come to, come to life. The oak tree becomes the negation of the acorn. So is the truth the acorn or is the truth the oak? The truth actually is the process of transformation that they have a contradictory relationship to each other and the negation of one becomes the birth of something new but the truth is in the change and in the process of that, of that, of that movement. Further to that then, <clears throat> if the truth is the whole in that sense, then the process of change, the process of contradiction is the central thing to being able to understand how society moves and changes and develops. The truth wasn't just feudalism, the truth isn't just the new capitalism, the truth is the contradiction that existed from these new forces in society producing a new, a new society. And so really, what we have here with Hegel is a method, if you like, of understanding how you, the evolution of society actually takes place the motor of change. It's no longer just looking at human society and human history as just a set of random acts that can't really be understood, that is mystical, 
um, that, that people can't really make sense of. What Hegel does is he puts a framework and a method that enables people to make sense of how contradiction comes together to produce new things. And therefore, you can understand society. You can understand how process and change takes place. So I'm just going to give you a, a quote from, from, from Engels in a second, because one of the things clearly that Hegel puts forward um, it, in terms of his dialectic, he puts this forward in, that, in the sense that it was this new consciousness, this new set of ideas that was the driver for human action. This was what it was like, and, and it almost puts these ideas as being almost above and separate to human activity, but that humans are the ones who put these things into action. It puts ideas above activity in lots of ways. And so, really, what Marx and Engels seek to do is, in some ways, it doesn't matter that Hegel's dialectic is idealistic and is ideas driven. They turn the dialectic around, they try and re establish the, the agency, the human agency within that change. And if you like it, I mean, people might have heard this quote from Marx where he says that being determines consciousness, not consciousness determining being. And so really what Mark, uh, Engels and Marx do is attempt to turn the dialectic from Hegel on its head and actually make it a materialist dialectic. A, a, the driver of contradiction and change within society is not some supernatural set of ideas, but actually human activity in the process of attempting to change society. This is what produces the ideas, and so they turn it around. So what Engels says is, of the dialectic, is that all successive historical systems are only transitory stages in the endless course of development of human society from the lower to the higher. Each stage is necessary and therefore justified for the time and conditions to which it owes its origin. But in the face of new, higher contradictions which develop in its own womb, it loses its validity and justification. It must give way to a higher stage which will also in turn decay and perish. And the reason why Engels and Marx look at this is because, of course, we absolutely welcome both the Enlightenment ideas, both the transformation of society towards capitalism, but for a lot of the young Hegelians, Marx, Engels, Feuerbach, there's a whole number of them that people can read, for a lot of them, actually, what they were also witnessing was the birth of a new class society that had inequality, oppression, alienation built into it, and they weren't satisfied with this final result. Actually, what they wanted to know was, actually, how do we get this change? And also, capitalism is not the final thing. If everything is transitory, if we can create new things like this, then actually we can also start to change capitalism. And therefore, the question for them was, one, actually, they absolutely were committed to this notion of the dialectic. At the second time, in the second instance as well, they were also committed to the notion and the idea that actually they were not prepared to settle for what capitalism had to offer and that there can be an alternative. The contradictions within society mean that something else is possible. So the question then for Marx and Engels is, where do the central contradictions in capitalism lie? And therefore, what is the motor for change that is, enables us to look at capitalism being a transitory phase of human development, and we can actually move on from that and create a better society than the one, than the one we have at the moment? And so really, the philosophy of Hegel is the algebra of revolution, if you like. It's the, it's, the, it's the essence of the idea that shows us that in those contradictions, we can look for, for change. So, in terms of how Marx and Engels then develop this, I think it's important to look at the second sort of key element in the development of Marxism, which is British political economy. And there are two names here which I think are important, which people, again, probably will have heard of from, from economics classes or stuff in school, for example. <coughs> Adam Smith. I assume most people have heard of Adam Smith. He wrote The Wealth of Nations and so on. He's often called you know, the father of bourgeois economics and capitalism and so on and so forth. He wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776. Adam Smith really was writing about capitalism as an absolute defence of capitalism. Because don't forget, in the shadows here, in the background here, we have still the landed gentry, the church, the people who ran the old order, who again feel absolutely, who are absolutely threatened by this new order, this new capitalism, this new system that's coming through. 
And therefore, what we see from Adam Smith, and I'm going to come on to a guy called David Ricardo, is a defence of capitalism in the face of the old order, an attempt to justify why capitalism is, is the right system for, 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 for people to develop and for people to be involved in. And so he basically attempts to justify capitalism as being natural. Now, it's important that we understand why that's happening, because, again, the Enlightenment and the whole set of ideas that were around in this, for this new revolutionary class was really against, like I say, the mysticism of how society had been understood before. And so they're constantly attempting to justify capitalism on the basis of how natural it is to humanity. It's a natural part of humanity to be competitive and so on and so forth. And therefore they start to, start to justify it in that way. In fact, there's a really lovely piece of writing where Karl Marx does a critique of Adam Smith's writings on human nature where Adam Smith takes a look at capitalism, the division of labour that takes place within it, how competitive people are, and so on, and he attempts to fit, therefore, human nature to capitalism. What Marx says is, is that if a new system of capitalism demands of people that they do compete in order to survive, how can we say this is an essential part of human nature? Actually, this is a part of the system that is creating, that is creating this type of, of human consciousness. And so there is a real sort of dichotomy, if you like, for Marx and, uh, and, uh, and Smith in terms of how they understand human nature. But it's important to note that for Adam Smith, in attempting to justify and explain and understand capitalism, he constantly attempts to pull it back to how natural it is in, to, in terms of human nature. For Smith as well, people might have heard of th phrases like the invisible hand of the market, the price mechanism. People must have heard supply and demand. And of course, what Adam Smith puts forward is that in the process of commodity production, the way in which prices and value is determined inside of society is through the interaction of supply and demand. And this is what creates the price mechanism, and it tells us what things are going to be worth. And so, of course, if you have way too much supply of something and not enough demand, prices are going to fall. If you have a lot of demand and limited supply, prices are going to rise. And it is this natural mechanism which Smith suggests actually puts forward what prices are and so on and what value is in 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 inside of society. David Ricardo actually, I think, is a more important economist for us in terms of understanding Marxism. Because Dave Ricardo actually then starts to look at a different way of understanding value and a different way of understanding how prices are determined and how the value of things is determined. And what Ricardo argued was that the value of a commodity or the quantity for which a commodity will exchange depends on the relative quantity of labour which is necessary for its production. In other words, it's the labour that goes into a product, into a commodity, that determines what its price would be. I'm going to go on and sort of dis describe this a little bit, a little bit further. Um, but really, for Ricardo, what you have is he sort of describes a situation in which, in the process of production, we have both labour and then we have also capitalists. And, and also, of course, then landowners. So he looks at rent, he looks at profits, and he looks at wages. And what Ricardo sort of determines, really, is that if it's true that the quantity of labour that goes into a product is what determines its value and its price, then there is a battle, really, between the capitalist and the worker, because the more that the worker is able to get for the production and for the things that, that they are producing, the less the capitalist will get. So there is a contradictory relationship between wages and profit, is what Ricardo really starts to put forward. And so Marx really builds on this and develops what's called the labour theory of value. And I'm just going to try and break it down and express it, because commodity production, it's important to look at commodities, because commodities themselves have two values. They have a use value. In other words, there's no point in producing something unless it has a use or a value for human beings. There's no point in producing it. So at the same time as it has a use value, it also has an exchange value, the value for which it's going to be bought and sold on the market and so on. In terms of commodity production as well then, what we're looking at, when we say that the exchange value of a commodity is determined by the amount of labour that goes into it, I'm just going to give an example. If it's just determined by the amount of labour that goes into it, then if you look at the production of a chair, for example, 
if I were to produce a chair, it would take really quite a long time. <laughs> I don't really have the skill set for it. I don't, you know, I'm not really a carpenter, a chair producer, and so on. So you're not going to measure how to buy a chair off someone like me. But we have somebody. <laughs> Thanks. If you have somebody who has the requisite level of skill, who's been trained in how to do it, who has the right tools and so on, of course they're going to produce a chair in a much better way than I'm going to. And further to that then, really what we're saying is, is that it's not just a question of labour in the abstract, it is the socially necessary labour, as determined by the average level of skill, average level of tools and so on at the time, it's socially necessary labour that is the important thing for us in terms of determining value and, and, determining, and determining price. So if that's the case, and we're looking at, across the board, socially necessary labour determining value and price, then the important thing about labour, because obviously under commodity production, everything becomes commodified. Labour becomes commodified. You know, we know what the use value of labour is, but what is the exchange value of labour? How is labour bought and sold on the market, if you like? What is it that determines the price of your wages? And the thing that's really important about labour as a commodity is that it expands its value when you put it to work. So when you think about people who get paid wages to go into work, let's just say, for example, I don't know, somebody who produces TVs, I don't know, maybe they're paid £300 a week to go into work and make the televisions and so on. Obviously, they don't make the whole thing themselves. It's all broken down, isn't it, into small elements of production. But they are paid £300 worth of wages, let's say, to come into work. When they come into work, do they only produce £300 worth of value? No, of course they produce way more than that. Yeah, they produce sometimes, you know, let's just say in TVs, I don't know, let's say they're part of producing five TVs in a week, you're talking two and a half thousand pounds here. So there is a massive difference between the price of labour when you bring it into work and then actually what labour produces when it comes into work and actually when it goes to work on the machinery and so on and in the process of production. And therefore the difference between the cost of labour but then what labour produces is really the difference is the profits. This is the surplus value that the capitalist extracts from the worker in order to, to make their profits. So, and let's just put it in a, in a different way then, because really, as a commodity then, we have both labour power and labour value. When you paid your wages, what are you paid for? You're paid in order that you can afford your rent, that you can afford clothing, maybe you're going to get a holiday out of it, if you're lucky right now. Uh, but this is what you're paid for, your capacity to come in, into work. When you come to work, actually your capacity expands massively and delivers the profit to the, to, to the capitalist. But therefore, there is a tension here, isn't there? Because for everybody knows, you know, like the strike that we had yesterday, there is a battle between those people that own the means of production, the capitalists, this new bourgeois class that's emerged. There is a battle between these people here and people like us who go into work for them. Yeah, there is, a, there is therefore at the very heart of capitalist production an inherent contradiction between those people who go into work and produce the wealth in society and those people who own the means of production and to extract surplus value and profit from, from those people. And of course the contradiction of that as well is that the more that labour produces, the more wealth that we create, the more that we create capital that's actually able to oppress us and crush us at the, sa at the same time. We become under the weight of the capital, capitalist system around us. So, and in terms of sort of understanding how these contradictions work themselves through in, in capitalism, it's interesting to think about if, if it is the case, which we know, that labour is the one that produces value, for the capitalists, their constant concern is how do I make labour more productive? How do I get labour to produce more and more in the amount of time that I have? Therefore, I'm going to invest in machinery, in plant, in capital, in technology to actually get these workers to be more productive. Let's look at an example. If we have, if we have for example, let's look at computers. If you got bought a computer 20 years ago, it would cost the earth in comparison to what computers cost now. 
What has changed in the production of computers? The development of technology, the development of machinery, research and development and so on has meant that there is less labour now required to produce one computer than there was 20 years ago. Therefore, the price of computers has dropped. Yeah? Also, when you think about that, and you think about things which are very labour-intensive, car production, for example, building houses, all these things require a massive input of human labour and therefore actually quite often will maintain their price and their value within the system. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so because we then have this dichotomy as well for the capitalist, where profit comes from the worker, but in order to make the worker more productive, they have to invest in the things that don't bring them profit. We also see a system which has a contradictory process, which also produces crisis. It produces crisis in two ways. Firstly, in that the organisation of capitalism is anarchic, a production under capitalism is anarchic. So we can see periodically, you know, overproduction of products, where we talked about the whole supply demand thing, leading to, you know, can lead to crises booms and slumped crises, these cyclical crises that happen within capitalism. But underlying it is also a deeper contradiction, which is that one between the investment in labour and the investment in machinery and capital and, and, and technology and so on, which means that actually built into the system is, a, is, is, is a, a deeper crisis in which the rate of profit starts to fall. Because when you think about, if we talk about, for example, a car worker, the number of machines that a car worker works on now, if you think about, let's go back 20, 30 years, for example, and we say we see a picture of one worker operating one, one machine. If we come forward 20 years, for example, and we look at now what one worker does now, quite often they'll be operating two, three, four different levels of machinery around them, which makes them much more productive. Overall, in the whole system of capitalism, when you look then at workers and you look at the machinery and the capital and so on that grows up around them, you start to see a contradiction in the system. Because it is these things, the, the capital and the machinery and so on, that doesn't deliver the profit against the labour that does. And therefore we start to see a tendency of the rate of profit to fall due to that process under capitalism. And therefore we have both crisis built into the system, but also at the same time, because what we have is a process of commodity production and commodification, what does it mean for the worker? Because actually what it means for the worker is something which both Marx and Engels were trying to examine and trying to understand as this new system was in birth. Engels, in fact, he wrote The Condition of the English Working Class, where he comes to Manchester, works in, in, in his father's factory and so on, and looks at the condition of the British working class. There are also a whole number of other socialists out there who are trying to make sense of the experience of the worker and the experience of labour under capitalism. And these were really the third most important part and, and, and um, uh, component parts of early Marxism, which was French socialism. And again, I mean, Engels has written a book called Socialism, Utopian and Scientific, in which he runs through a whole number of different sets of these arguments about the utopian socialists. And the reason why the utopian socialists are important for us is because really what we would argue and what Marx argues is that in the process of commodity production, labour becomes alienated. Because really, essentially, when we look at the history of human society, when we look at what it is that makes people human, their ability to labour, our ability to shape the world around us, to create things, to build things, it's an essence of humanity. What does capitalism do with labour? It turns it into a commodity. It turns you into something that is bought and sold. And it alienates, if you like, that process of labour and production from, the humani from humanity. And so, you know, we see that most starkly under capitalism because the relationship between people and the things that they create is so broken down. You know, the person that creates, produces TVs is not going to produce the whole TV. They just produce a component part of the TV. Yeah, so everything gets broken down under capitalism. Production gets broken down and also, and also labour. And so really, what the utopian socialists were doing, and we're talking about people like Saint-Simon, Saint uh, Fourier, if you want to look them up at all, argued really that capitalism was far from natural. And it was far from natural because it didn't satisfy the human needs and the desires that human beings had, and it couldn't satisfy them precisely because people became alienated in this, in this, in this, new, in this new process. 
Now, the utopian socialists are very interesting to read in the sense that what they sort of start to look at, these are people who went through the process of the French Revolution, they're people who experienced the terror of the French Revolution, and they're people who start to think that really what we must do in terms of bringing about change is to look at ideally what, would a society, what sort of society do we want? How do we want society to function? Can we create that society without revolutionary change? Can we create that society now if we appeal, for example, to the capitalists about how societies could be looked at? And people come up with very, very elaborate plans of how to create these societies. Robert Owen was another utopian socialist who created a society, a, a, a sort of model society called New Lanark. You can still go there to now, up, uh, now up in Scotland, where he produces this micro community, if you like, where they have the factory, the mill, for example. On site, they build schools for the children. There's different ways of looking at how they feed people. In other words, what they're trying to do, and they're, they're very specific, you know, there's some, something like 2,500 people can live in this society, for example. So there are very elaborate plans, which you can almost look back on with humour, almost, in terms of actually the reality of where capitalism is going and where the utopian socialists want to take it. But really what they do, I think, is they start to look at the impact of capitalism in terms of alienation and in terms of oppression. Fourier, for example, was a massive critic of bourgeois marriage. Yeah, he was the man actually who created the term feminism, if you like. He was totally opposed to the way in which women were oppressed inside of capitalist society. He looks at how the bourgeois institutions that have grown up with capitalism around things like the marriage and so on are very oppressive uh, for women, but also how they actually distort society and they distort humanity um, in, in, in a massive way. Further to that, you know, when you think about the, um, the, the ways in which workers then become confined to one job or another, they have a massive criticism of this. They say this is not human for people to be stuck in a factory for the whole of their lives, for example. People should be able to experience different op occupations. They should be able to use their brains in different way. It shouldn't be prescriptive that one person is a factory worker, another person is a bin collector, another person is a farmer. People should have the opportunity to explore and expand their minds. People should have access to culture, that all of these things are an essential part of humanity that capitalism actually has, dis has not allowed people to have. The limitations of capitalist production uh, put huge limitations on labour and, 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 and our ability to experience uh, an, a, a whole number of things which we're quite clearly, quite clearly capable of. And so really, the problem really, I suppose, with the utopian socialists is that they see the working class, if you like, as really the victims of this, the suffering classes, the people who must be helped, yeah, that we must appeal in a philanthropic way to the capitalists who have the power to help these poor people, to help them realise themselves as full functioning human beings. Now for Marx and Engels, really for them, they try and reassert a scientific approach towards socialism which is to say that when Marx and Engels witness and experience the struggles of workers that are taking place at the time, what they say is, is that this is not a class that needs somebody else's help in that sense. Workers are not just sufferers under capitalism, they also have the economic power and we've seen through the strikes and so on, the Silesian weavers, for example, and so on, that they look at different examples of working class strikes and struggles that were going on at the time, that actually these people have not just economic power, but they have the ability when they come together to fight back against the very system that is holding them down. In other words, what capitalism creates is its very own grave digger. And so in the process of creating its own grave digger, actually, here we then see that the central contradiction in capitalism between capital and labour is the driver. It is inevitable there will be a struggle in that contradiction. In the process of that struggle, what happens to working class people when they start to fight back is that they start to shake off really what they call the muck of ages. All the things that have held us back, the racism, the sexism, the oppression, the division, the notions that we're not good enough, that we're not powerful enough, that we're not strong enough, when people move into struggle against that situation around them, they start to realise in themselves that they have the ability to create something very different and very new. And so for Marx and Engels, when, they look at, when you look at the three component parts of Marxism, 
Not only do we have the algebra of revolution, the contradiction at the heart of society, that means this is not the end. There can be another stage of human development. We've identified the economic power and the strength as well that the working class has to carry that through. And further to that, we identified that in those collective struggles are the kernels, the seeds of a new society that can be formed in the process of revolutionary change. And this really takes Marx up towards, I would say, around 1848, when on the eve of the democratic revolutions that go across Europe, Marx is commissioned to write the Communist Manifesto, in which he says, a spectre is haunting Europe, it is the spectre of communism. It's these three component parts of Marxism, the philosophy, economy, and the ideas around fighting back against alienation that takes Mark, Marx and Engels to that point and really is the introduction to Marxist political economy. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Jo for that. And uh, if she isn't a teacher already, she bloody well should be. <laughs> but, uh, I've got, uh, I've got uh, a very naive question in a sense. Um, I know that uh, Lenin uh, developed um, uh, Marx's ideas, um, talked about um, the dictatorship of the proletariat, the slow uh, disappearance of class society, um, the withering away of the state and all of that. Um, but I'm just wondering whether, whether Marx had any notion of the dialectic operating under socialism. Are there contradictions in socialism? Why is it? I mean, I, you know, I know the um, basic tenets of our beliefs is that socialism is the end of class society, but uh, uh, from a philosophical point of view, uh, why is it that, uh, that, that socialism will not have contradictions working um, uh, within it, uh, uh, driving towards change? What does Marxism say about creating surplus? Is there any surplus or where does the must come from? Yes, and yes. the Marxist coin here, my system, the surplus or the investment, where does it come from? I mean, in a new society, I mean, no. If you say uh, under capitalism, mm -hmm. surplus is created and it is invested, right, to create more profits for the capitalists. Mm -hmm. So under Marxism, or well, Marxist economy, I mean, how do we do the investment? Where does the uh, profit for the money come. <laughs> um, yeah, <clears throat> I do have a question. I have uh, more of a contribution, more like wondering in a sense. Um, whenever I speak on that matter to any of uh, my colleagues or friends who do not share my particular views, they always actually come up with what the speaker talked about, the natural dimension of capitalism, which is, I don't know, either a huge ignorance of history or a huge ignorance of biology in some sense, because uh, I mean, I'm no historian, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we've been feudalists for about a thousand years. We've been uh, slave societies for God knows how many years, uh, and primitive societies before that, and capitalism has existed for about 200 years, and I'm sure if it was natural, it would have existed since the beginning of humanity itself. Um, also, biology-wise, I always thought that many natural things that are natural to human beings we share with all the other alive beings, with uh, within the sort of the life of the living world, so I do not think we share capitalism, particularly much with animals or trees or whatever. Um, on the other note, then I was reading a newspaper recently, which I just placed my hands on because it had four pictures of Marx on it, and I thought, oh, that looks pretty. Um, and it said that Marx's uh, idea of the, uh, his theory of labour was replaced with the more modern supply and demand, which I thought was actually older than Marx, but never mind. Um, but I do not quite see how they contradict each other, because surely the amount of hours worked by labour uh, is the definition of their wage and their spending value, just creating demand. And it's also the definition of supply, because this is, in essence, the productivity of all the factors of production, because it's the productivity of labour, capital and land, in a sense. Let me try and answer one of, one of the questions. Um, someone asked uh, about use value and the fact that capitalism produces many things that are not useful. This is absolutely true. Capitalism produces a lot of things that are absolute crap or indeed harmful to human beings. You think about weapons, uh, stealth bombers, nuclear missiles and so on. Um, that's not really what Marx is talking about. 
When Marx says a commodity has a value and a use value, he's saying, on the one hand, it has a value that allows it to exchange, it's the product of human labour in general and so on, that's the, the value of a commodity, which takes the form of exchange value, as Joe explained. When he talked about use value, all he was really saying is it, it's an object of utility to someone, somewhere. And a stealth bomber is very useful if you're a government trying to oppress people around the world. That's all Marx means by use values. One of the insanities of capitalism is it does produce all kinds of things that we wouldn't dream of producing in a socialist society. We wouldn't need to build stealth bombers, nuclear missiles, and so on and so forth. We're compelled to build those things under capitalism because of the class nature of society. So use value is a very broad term and includes lots of things that are wasteful that we we would eradicate uh, in, a, in, a, in a socialist society. And just to touch on some of the other questions that people have raised, how would this work in a socialist world? Well, part of what we're talking about in, when we talk about transition to socialism is building a world where things are not subordinated to the law of profit and the law of value. Of course, we would still produce things in a socialist society, but we'd produce collectively, democratically, in accordance with people's needs. We would decide collectively what we actually need as humanity uh, to survive, to prosper, to fulfill uh, our cultural, spiritual, and personal needs. And then we would go away and collectively produce it. We wouldn't produce it in accordance with the laws of profit and the laws of value. So it's about liberating the use values and the kind of use values we want from the laws of profit and value under capitalism. Um. So I'll still, I still I struggle with the, the term the, the grave digger, um, the, the capitalist system producing the grave digger of the capitalist class. Um, I, I, maybe I'm just a pessimist, but sometimes I just I, I cannot see the the I can see it in you perhaps, but the spirit of resistance when I walk down the street. How many people are looking at their iPhones, looking at the adverts, completely distracted? And here we are, quite a small group. Aren't we? Being that all that there's a weight of oppression and violence and distraction, and as we rise up, they will use everything in their power to squash us. And that scares the life out of me when I see those cavalry charges. Words that does does worry me. I do have a bit of attachment to my life, but it's, I'm still scared when they do that. And aren't, aren't we being utopians in our ideas that we can actually <coughs> overcome that? I'm fairly new at all this, um, and I've really appreciated, I've obviously I've been a member of the SWB for a few months, but I really appreciated um, the talk because it kind of broke everything down a bit, and you sort of see where all the Marxist terms came from, and um, the different areas where Marx obviously brought it all together for us. Um, I've got actually a, a, a question, and, and just to kind of come back on uh, what, the, what the general said. I was really inspired last night to see however many thousand people in a big room all cheering and shouting, um, the workers united can never be defeated. Um, and obviously, in the grand scheme of things, that that, that is very, very small. Um, we're in the middle of London that holds six million people on its own. But I think there's not so much the fact that the, obviously the working class are, are always oppressed and have always been oppressed because it benefits the capitalists. Um, but I think we are being a great, like, I don't think it would it'll end up being, like you see in the films with the war and the horses and the cavalry and <coughs> people out on the streets with um, big battle guns and things like that. I think the way that the capitalists are doing it now is working. It's pretty much the old sort of divide and conquer. It's, in, it's doing things like the bedroom tax and um, like um, racism, allowing far right parties like UKIP to come along and controlling the media, which actually absolutely baffles me the way that they just completely omit um, 5,000 people standing outside the BBC. Or um, obviously, I'm from Scotland, as you can tell. Um, so uh, the way that the Yes campaign is just pretty much ignored in all the newspapers. So the power of the media, I think, are really doing a great job to oppress us. So I think when Obviously, when we go out and show on the streets, the 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 more the struggle there is, the more the the, the bigger the struggle, the bigger the uprising. And obviously, the SWP has got bigger and bigger and bigger since um, the crash in two thousand and eight. And I think with the, the power of the media and the power of things that are going on just now, I think that can only get bigger. And if last year's Marxism, if this year's Marxism was bigger than last year's Marxism, 
then I think we'll, I think we could, I think we can take them on. <laughs> <laughs> the speaker or anybody else, uh, obviously you, we, you don't want to sort of put marks up there and idolise them, you don't want to idolise anyone, so I wondered if there was any critiques of any Marxist theory, not just in the beginning, but obviously if there was things at the end they changed or heard, if there was any kind of critiques of Marx that anybody wanted to give or any writers that could maybe point me in the right direction. <laughs> I just love I wanted to um, answer, try, and, try and answer the question about would there be a dialectic under socialism. I, I think it's interesting just, just to explain quickly what the dialectic is. For Marx, there was a notion, um, well, I'll tell you what it is. And under capitalism, what we see is everything being separated up into separate little components, into commodities, unrelated separate units. What Marx argued that in terms of a dialectic was that. What happens in history and the way that the economy is organised and the way that we produce things actually directly affects how we behave, how we think, how we organise. And that everything has to be seen to in a totality. We have to look at history, we don't separate things off. Um, and that any change that comes about in society is about the contradiction that essentially exists under capitalism between the conflict between the, the two classes. You know, uh, Joe outlined it uh, very simply in a sense in terms of we want better wages, they want better profits. It's an immediate clash. And what we see under, under capitalism, um, and often you know, through reformist ideas, is, is an attempt that somehow the state can, um, you know, through the state, through society, we can mediate, we can make a balance and equilibrium under capitalism that kind of makes everything okay. Um, and you know, their version of okay and our version of okay is the essential contradiction in that sense. So I think under socialism and the process of change that would lead to socialism, absolutely, is dialectical, isn't it? It's the sense of those clashes, those fights, those struggles that we'd be involved in, in terms of, uh, of starting to move towards socialism, would essentially be a very, very dialectical process. But I think under the continuation of socialism, there will still be, will, will still be a dialectic. What we won't have, though, I'm hoping anyway, in socialism I'm after, is a, a, class of, a, a class society of any sort. What we would have is the notion of the working class as an agency actually becoming the people who run society and run society on the basis of what people need and not, and not on the basis of profit. So elements of the dialectic that we see under capitalism will disappear, but that process of change in terms of how we shift, because we're not going to, we have a revolution, we aren't going to have a perfect social society on day one. It's going to take a few days as people <laughs> <laughs> we start to argue it out and decide what we want. The difference will be we will get to decide, we will have a development of democracy that will start to see socialism to emerge. And, and in a sense, we can't tell you now what socialism is going to be like, can we? Because we are confined by capitalism in terms of our biggest dreams. You know, the ideas that we have are, are very much con you know, confined by the limitations that society produces on us because of what we understand and know at the moment. So actually, the, there will be a dialectical process, but it will be a different one in the context of not having those contradictions, but in terms of having a democratic process where the majority of people decide what we do and how we organise society. And it will be based on things like our ability to create in the way that we need to create, to use our labour, you know, to be a gardener one day, a bin man the next, to get jobs done, to not sort of celebrate the idea that some people deserve hundreds of thousands of pounds a year because they're cleverer than, than people who empty bins or, or clean out sewers. The whole world will be very different. We will still be, you know, involved with materialist ideas. We will understand the process of change through society and historical change that's gone on. But actually what we'll be fighting for and developing be something about equality and an end to class society and an end to a state that protects the status quo that we've got at the moment and actually a society that benefits everybody. Uh, this is my first time here. I have to say I'm very impressed with Marxism 2014, etc. Et um, I have a question, which I think stroke comment. Um, the majority of ordinary people out there in London, Britain, Europe, Africa, Asia, all over the world, mm -hmm. kind of know and feel that there's something wrong with the current system in the world. You know, so often people are doing things about it. But if you go out and talk to the majority of people out there, an awful lot of them cannot see what the alternative is. Um, that, that's my experience. When you talk to people about socialism, I think a lot of people see socialism a bit like Christians, a bit weird and wonderful sometimes, not so weird and wonderful sometimes, they dress in a certain way, they look a certain way, etc., etc. 
And what I'm interested in having a discourse about, and this is probably an open question to everybody, is how do we who believe that there is a real alternative get that message across to people from the diverse range of backgrounds that, they come, that we come across in ordinary everyday life in a language and in a way that they can relate to. And I emphasize language in a way because I think some of the language and some of the ways that some of us who believe that there is an alternative use actually alienates people. Um, and we have to be real and honest about that. So for instance, I work in a building where there are zero hours contracts staff. Absolutely horrendous. I hate zero hours contracts. And this one, one, one young woman she has two hours up, say, from 9 to 11 in the morning. Then there's this massive gap <laughs> until 3 o'clock. She's a swimming instructor. Massive gap. She can't do anything. She can't go home because home's too far. There's nothing to do locally. So this poor woman literally sits for two hours playing on her phone and whatever, whatever, because there's nothing else she can do. And I you know I, I was telling her that I was coming along to this. She said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She does that. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can do about it. And my heart bleeds for, for young people like her. She's about 20, I think she's 24. Because she knows there's something wrong with what's happening, but she can't see any alternative. Okay. And I was struggling with that. I know it's not going to be, you know, you, people are going to get it, but I was struggling to think of, of how I can get this young person as an example to actually begin to see there's an alternative. Because I want, when I mentioned she goes, oh yeah, but socialism collapsed under this point. So she has an idea of what's happened in the world. She's not completely ignorant. It's just really how we do that. And I hope that that's a discourse which continues throughout this, this weekend or however many more days we've got left. But you gave a wonderful presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think it really are, but I think it's a very good Criticism of Marxist political economy, uh, which we should all know, which is it doesn't really have one. Now that might sound controversial to some people, but if you know what you're talking about, you don't know where really you're finishing his political economy. He just started it. Um, Marx started, you know, we know, uh, you hold capital, which is about, as uh, one uh, gentleman mentioned in passing, one of the factors of production of classical economics. Right? Um, which is capital, land, and labour. Marx was going to write further volumes in both of the other factors. He died long before he had a chance to do that. Very few people have carried on that work since. That's part of our job, and we're not doing it. I think uh, that not just in Britain, but across the world, the, 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 the left, left and labour movement has let itself down really, really badly, and it's become uh, politically incompetent, but politically. Illiterate. Sorry, uh, economically illiterate. I think, you know, all, all being that was a good presentation of, of, of uh, some of the, the basics of Marx's political economy. There's a lot of stuff that we just, that we should know and we don't, you know, and it's partly due to the, the weakness of the movement. But political economy itself, we understand what political economy is, for instance, as opposed to economics. Um, economics is what started to happen around right at the same time as, as Marx. Uh, the, the development of what we now call the neoclassical school, uh, marginalism and all that sort of stuff. Um, that's once, the, the, from the development from about Smith's time through Ricardo, Malthus, to Mill, when uh, it became <laughs> support, supposedly scientific, and of course you have that system where uh, economics now works. Of course it never actually did. But um, they, they drop the political side because they don't want people thinking, well, actually, our ethics suggest that you can have an alternative way of doing this. You know, that could be an alternative to market driven economics. Um, so, up until Smith wrote, all politically, political economy was up for grabs. You know, and when Smith did write, all he was doing was a description. It wasn't really, it was quite apologistic, but it wasn't a, really an apology for capitalism. Capitalism was a what hadn't been invented. You know, that was much, much later. It's that's the point he's thought, he's thought to say that. Um, but what did develop, uh, what Smith did was he took years and years and years of black autonomy and put it, made it into a massive system which actually brought, brought it all together for the first time. Um, he was trying to develop a, a science of man uh, in, in that enlightenment period. 
uh, along this part of the field and stuff like that, you know, uh, well about Mexico and so of course. Um, but political, it's really important for us to know the difference between political economy and economics that came after it. And I, I think it's disappointing when a Marxist gives an ex a description of political economy and doesn't make that distinction, you know. Um, because that's kind of what's gone wrong in the 20th century, uh, in, in, I mean, the 21st century. Economics is it's taught to you as here's a system, as, as was mentioned in yesterday's uh, meeting about, about economics. Uh, here's, here's a system that all works together. The only thing you can do is change some of these levers and all the rest of it, and we'll, eventually we'll get it to work. Um, which is, uh, that's kind of macro of economic view that, 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 that sort of gains and reintroduced. But I mean, economics in general is just kind of something that system of slowing up. We need to know the difference between these things. I know I've obviously I'm to do that and I'm not going to have a good job with it. But that, we need to know the, the, the difference between political economy and economics that came after. That's, that's, that's an important distinction amongst others. I mean, if you're going to do this next time, I would suggest um, try and speak about, because we're in London, and like a lot of jobs are really basically service sector jobs. Even we sort of assume a lot of people here are probably like knowledge workers or teachers, etc., etc. Try and use kind of like service space. Um, examples to make it a bit more concrete for everybody. That's basically I mean, I suppose just to come back on this question around the uh, separating out economics and then also talking about political economy. Um, I suppose really the sort of essence, if you like, of Marxism and what I was trying to put across is that we do attempt to explain the world in a totality. And we do ex attempt to explain economics in terms of human relations as well. The separation out of economic processes from human life and human relations is a triumph of bourgeois economics. It's not something that I think we want to buy into. My personal feeling is, is that when we are trying to ex look at how Marx comes to these conclusions, Marx doesn't just sit there and study the market. Yeah, Marx studies and understands the human experience of capitalism, the process of revolutionary change that had preceded him, the dual revolutions of the French Revolution and the Industrial Revolution, and attempts to look at a totality of how that shapes a new system in order to understand that new system to see how it can change in the future. And the question of human agency within economics is a massively important part inside of Marxism. Now, of course, if you want a further economic explanation or explanation of the system, you really need to, I think, th this is not the meeting where we're talking purely about just that type of analysis. There's a whole course on Marxist economics, which will be, which will be uh, happening at Marxism. Um, in that, again, you won't find people just talking about the market, the price mechanism, bourgeois concepts of economics. We will be talking about how Marx looks at economics and looks at political economy, which is to not separate out all these things as if they are somehow separate mystical things that can't be understood in totality. They can be understood by the individual worker, yet yeah, they can be a tool in the hands of everybody in terms of changing society around us. So the total picture is massively important to put forward and to just separate out economics from politics in society, from evolution in society and so on, is really falling into the hands of the bourgeoisie and the ruling class, I would say, because you are separating out and removing from people an idea that they can understand totally how an individual worker here is affected and what relationship that has to the economic crisis that has just taken place inside of capitalism. We don't separate these things out. We're trying to find an understanding and a, a totality in that sense as well. The other thing I suppose I want to come on to is that somebody raised the question that if about, so there was a guy at the back who talked about if capitalism was natural, then it would have existed for all time. The thing I want to pick up on with that is, is that, you know, we do have to have an appreciation that, you know, for the vast part of human history, for 90% really of human existence, it existed in what we would call primitive communist societies. You know, it didn't exist in a class society in the way that we, that we have now. There were the development of different productive techniques in agriculture, for example, that started to create the material basis on which 
you know, we have different productive levels on which surplus was produced, in which class starts to emerge. So there are different evolutionary processes at work around human development as well. So it's not true that if capitalism was naturally would have existed for the whole of time, it can still be a natural part of human evolution and development. It's just not the final part of human evolution and development, which is what the bourgeois economists are trying to say when they justify capitalism as being natural. So that's, that's an important thing as well. The other thing then as well is that when people are talking about of course, under capitalism, the guy raised the question about a surplus is produced and then it's invested. Well, how will that, what, will, what will happen under socialism? And of course, the problem with surplus now is that it is produced and taken by a tiny minority of people. I mean, people saw at the opening rally last night that Judith talked about five families in the UK who have as much wealth as 20% of the poorest people inside the UK. Right now, what is surplus therefore used for under capitalism? It's not used for the benefit of the whole of humanity. It is used to keep this tiny number of people on top in their positions, extracting more surplus. So the question is not just about surplus. The question is, is how would we organize production? We wouldn't organize production to give a tiny number of people a huge amount of wealth. We would organize production so that the wealth of human labor benefits the whole of human labor. And of course, we'd have different priorities in how we produce things then. We won't be producing the weapons, you know? We won't be producing, we won't have this useless money spent on marketing. Again, one of these things that you just think, how useful is this to humanity? It's useful to the capitalists, it's not useful to us <coughs> in humanity. And therefore, of course, we will change a whole different set of priorities about how we produce and so on. But surplus will be a very, very different question under a capitalist society. Then when we, the, the declining rate of profit that the guy asked the, the resources books about, there are some books here at the front on this. Chris Harmon also does a very good book on explaining the politics of economic uh, uh, crisis and so on as well. So if you go into bookmarks and ask them, they will definitely point you towards the right text and so on. So I want to just come on to this question about the grave digger of capitalism. And it sort of fits in really with some of the things that people were talking about in terms of how, how do we get to this point where we're all existing under this society, uh, we all have within us, our consciousness has been shaped by the society that we have been brought up in. How do we break from a society that we are so fundamentally a part of? How do we see something different in the future? How are the working class, the grave diggers of capitalism? And of course, again, we have to look at things deeper in terms of trying to get a grasp of this because we have to all survive on a, on a daily basis and so on. We all, you know, I mean, there was two statements that Mark said, which I suppose expl try and explain this in a better way. The first one he said was, was that the ideas in any society are the, the prevailing ideas in any society are the ideas of the ruling class. You know, they do own the media, they own the means of production, they own the mental means of production. Everything is about propping up their system. At the same time, the emancipation of the working class is the act of the working class. How can working class people liberate themselves when the prevailing ideas inside their heads are the ideas of the society in which they live? And the truth is, is that therefore, the central contradiction in capitalism, in terms of wage labour, and in this, the struggle between the capitalist and the worker is the key to this. Because the truth is, is that if we want more, if in society ordinary working people want a bigger slice of the pie, and it's not just the case that people just think, oh, I wouldn't mind a little bit more so I could get an extra few clothes in my wardrobe, I wouldn't mind a little bit more so I could buy myself another nice TV. Actually, at the moment, for most people, they have to struggle and fight back and strike for things like better wages because they're struggling to bloody survive under this system. You know, I was on strike yesterday with one and a half million people. It wasn't the case that people suddenly said, I'm going to strike tomorrow because you know what? In this strike is the seat of the new society that's going to take me towards <laughs> socialism. No, no, no. I went on strike because I want a bloody pay rise. Right? But if I don't go on strike with other people, I have no power in this society. Therefore, there's something about fighting back that teaches me that my power lies collectively. And therefore, it's important for me in my workplace to collectivise people, to have a picket line on my workplace, to try and give people that sense of strength and be able to fight back in a way that can win. 
So collectivism is demanded of the working class if they want to win anything. The system forces us into that collective struggle if we want something better for ourselves. Also, I know for a fact that when people come into struggle, you know what's going to happen now, is that when I go back into work on Monday, we're going to be talking about how the media reported on our strike. We're going to be talking about what David Cameron has said about our strike. What is that going to do? It's going to start to expose and open up a whole number of different set of ideas about how this society is run. Eton boys, who are they helping out? They're helping out their mates in industry. How are these people connected? What a difference does it make if we strike and we fight back to other people in the working class, the people on the zero hours contract? Actually, those people's heads are lifted every time they see somebody else going out and fighting back as well. And so people don't come into struggle with fully formed ideas of where they want this to go. But in the process of struggle itself, it challenges all the prevailing ideas inside of society. And to be honest, there's a whole number of things that are challenging that already. You know, we say the media's all powerful. Andy Coulson's just been jailed for hacking. You know? And when you think about, actually, the ways in which the media tries to put a whole number of different sets of ideas forward to prop up and back up the system, and people defy it, you know, in a whole number of ways as well. People aren't just automatons that just suck everything up and aren't able to think for themselves. They have their own different experiences. It's like now, apparently we have an economic recovery. Apparently. Now, this is in every single newspaper everywhere. Do you think every single worker in Britain believes there's a recovery? No. Where do they feel it? No, they don't feel there's a recovery. They know there's a recovery for the rich, but there's not a recovery for them. The inequality in this system is being laid bare all the time. Now, the question then is, if that is, struggle is an inevitable part of the system, right? Struggle is inevitable. Victory isn't. Yeah, winning is not inevitable. Yeah, we can go in to fight. We can fight for better wages. In the process of fighting for better wages, we can actually start to fight. I mean, sometimes people will strike against racism as well. They'll fight back over ideological questions, not just economic questions. There's a whole different ways in which class struggle can take place. But actually, if those struggles are going to win, what do people need? And this is the point, really, I think, about what Marxism is about. Marxism is about being a tool in the hands of the working class to when it comes to fighting in those inevitable battles that they have a better chance of winning. That's why Marx wrote revolutionary newspapers. You know, him and Engels are on the battle lines, they're there with the newspapers trying to influence the struggle, trying to shape it, trying to make people win against the capitalist class always, with the workers always. And therefore, we know which side we're on. We know that struggle is going to be inevitable. But we now have a task in front of us, which is to fight and build up strength on our side. And it's like Trotsky said about an understanding about working class consciousness, is that he knew all he needed to knew was the first time they met a group of factory workers. Because on the one hand, you had a factory worker who actually had a real sense of class consciousness was anti-racist, anti-sexist, against homophobia, would always stand up in solidarity with worker struggles and so on. On the other side, you had a worker who accepted the bigoted racist ideas that are prevalent in society, accepted the sexist ideas of society, wanted to cross the picket line. And in between of these two poles, you have the majority of people who can go one way or the other. How do we shape and influence struggle it's not always at the point of struggle you're going to influence it. It's on the day-to-day -day stuff now that we are trying to build up the strength and the confidence of our side so that we can influence struggles in the future. And I think only in that way do we understand Marxism as not some abstract academic theory, but actually a theory that helps people to understand and grasp what their power in the world is and their ability to influence and change things and shape a very different society coming out of it.